This is a response to P.P. Simmons' video, The Devastation of Evolution, Chirality, Evolution is a Catastrophic Failure. In it, you read essentially verbatim from an article by a PhD creationist chemist. I'll get onto your source later, but since you seem to have accepted his claims at face value with no effort to confirm them in any way, you've essentially taken ownership of them. So for the purposes of this video, I'll be addressing you directly and showing you why you shouldn't always unquestioningly believe everything you read. The evolutionary community became very excited because they viewed the work of Stanley Miller and Harold Urey as scientific proof that life could have been formed from chemicals. At the end of the experiment, the products were found to contain a few amino acids. Since amino acids are the individual links of long-chain polymers called proteins, and proteins are important in our bodies, newspapers quickly reported there was laboratory evidence that now proved life came from chemicals. Firstly, it makes no difference what the newspapers said about the results of this experiment any more than what sneaky, dishonest and dishonorable creationists did. Since newspapers are in the business of sensationalism while creationists are in the business of lying, wouldn't it have made a lot more sense to look into what scientists who are in the business of doing science had to say on the matter? If you had, then you might have found out that the only thing that this experiment proved was that it is possible to generate more complex organic molecules from simpler precursors using natural processes and without involving magic or invisible pixies. But there is a major problem. Life was never formed in that experiment. The product was amino acids, which are the normal everyday chemicals that do not live. Even unto this day, there is no process that has ever converted amino acids into a life form. But this fact does not stop evolutionists from claiming that this experiment is proof that life came from chemicals. Once again, you repeat your downright lie that rationalists claim that the Miller-Urey experiment is proof that life arose via chemical processes. No scientist claims that this experiment proves this, it merely demonstrates that one of the many steps required for the process of abiogenesis is physically possible. The fact that you seem to think that because a primitive slime didn't ooze out of that flask or any other is any kind of argument that abiogenesis is impossible demonstrates that you're either amazingly ignorant or willing to say anything to defend your ludicrous assertions no matter how stupid it is. Evolutionists know that amino acids do not live. But they call this proof anyway, because they claim that amino acids are the building blocks of life. You repeat the filthy lie for a third time. I'd be really interested in seeing the exception clause for your ninth commandment, because I'm not aware that there is one. Is it okay to deceive if it's in the name of your baby Jesus? If not, then I'd be getting myself a pair of asbestos underpants if I were you. In addition, the building blocks of life is a layman's term used to describe the biochemical organization of living systems to school children, and for you to use it to play this banal little word game in the hope that it'll pass for an argument is yet another testament to your monumental dishonesty. Can you hear your baby Jesus crying yet? Just as there had to be an assembler to make a moving vehicle from those auto parts, there had to be an assembler of those amino acids to make the protein so that life could exist in our bodies. The fact that car parts can't diffuse through solution to find each other and can't react to form higher levels of order while amino acids and peptides can seems to have escaped your notice. And so does the fact that we've seen cars being designed and built and therefore know that they're designed and built, but we've never seen an all-powerful gin stitching together amino acids into proteins. Just because you reworded the tired old watchmaker argument doesn't mean that your analogy is as flawed as Kent Hovind's understanding of the US tax code. When two molecules appear identical and their structures differ only by being mirror images of each other, these molecules are said to have chirality. In our body, every single amino acid of every protein is found with the same left-handed chirality. Although Miller and Urey formed amino acids in their experiments, all the amino acids that formed lacked chirality. It is a scientifically verifiable fact that a random chance process which forms a chiral product can only be a 50-50 mixture of the two optical isomers. There are no exceptions. The fact that chirality was missing in those amino acids is not just a problem to be debated. It points to a catastrophic 
failure that life cannot come from chemicals by natural processes. The only failure in this clip is your inability or unwillingness to understand basic chemistry. Before I explain why though, I'd like to point something out. When you said all the amino acids that formed lack chirality, I wasn't sure whether you were using your mouth or your anal sphincter. By the definition of the word and by its use by chemists everywhere, all the amino acids except glycine were chiral molecules because they potentially could exist as more than one stereochemical isoform. What you meant to say was that there was no bias given to any isomer and the amino acids formed a racemic mixture where all enantiomers were present at equal concentration. Now this might seem a little pedantic, but I mention it for good reason. If your chemist was such an expert, then why is he so sloppy with his language? You may reply, well, he was merely simplifying his terms for a lay audience. In which case, I would ask you why you're wasting your time and embarrassing yourself in making this pathetic video based on a single article aimed at non-scientists instead of doing some proper research and finding out the real facts for yourself. If you'd done that, you would have found out that while random reactions indeed cannot form specific optical isomers, no scientist claims that the enantiomeric specificity of life occurred by a random process. Here's an excellent review that describes several possible mechanisms for the development of enantiomeric excesses, including experimental data to support them. To be unaware of this kind of work strongly suggests that your chemist is either woefully stupid or just another disingenuous, mendacious creationist prick. Chirality is not just a major problem for evolution, it is a dilemma, a conundrum. According to evolution, natural processes must explain everything over long periods of time. However, the process that forms chirality cannot be explained by natural science in any amount of time. No, the process that forms chirality cannot be explained by your idiot chemist in any amount of time. As I already showed you, real scientists have no problem in developing multiple possible and plausible explanations and producing real evidence to support them. Also, why do you suddenly claim that this is an issue for evolution? You must know from the countless times this particular piece of misinformation has been refuted that the subject of your video is abiogenesis and that evolution explains the mechanisms for the diversification of pre-existing life forms. They are not the same thing. I can only assume that creationists think that they can undermine the credibility of one of the most successful and powerful theories in the whole of science by conflating it with a field of study that is in its relative infancy. That is just downright dishonest, and you should be ashamed of yourself. When we show evolutionists that the laws of natural science cannot explain the existence of chirality, they will say that the process happened a long time ago by some unknown method that they cannot explain. Really, now who's relying on a supernatural explanation? Although they would never call it divine intervention, they certainly are relying on faith and not on scientific facts. I've already shown you that scientists have multiple explanations for the development of stereospecificity, so this is just another blatant lie. Now, I admit that we don't know and maybe never will know exactly which of these processes contributed to the development of life here on Earth, but that's not the point. The point is that the mere fact that we've discovered them means that there's no need to invoke your deity or anyone else's for this aspect of the origin of life. Rationalists don't rely on supernatural explanations because we have no reason to believe that anything supernatural exists or that if it does it has any influence in the real world. Instead, we replace the dark nooks and crannies in our knowledge that you fill with your God with the words I don't know and then work towards illuminating them with concrete and measurable facts and explanations rooted in reality. And with each new insight, with each new explanation of the previously unknown, those recesses grow just a little dimmer and slowly fade away until one day there'll be nowhere left for gods to hide and they'll just slowly disappear. DNA is not a stable chemical molecule, and without a repair mechanism, it would easily deteriorate by chemical oxidation and other processes. There is no mechanism to explain how DNA could exist for millions of years while the repair mechanism evolved. I'm not sure what this has to do with chirality, so I'm assuming that your chemist has the same attention span as Nephilim Free. He also seems to have the same level of understanding when it comes to abiogenesis. 
Early replicating polymers that could not duplicate themselves rapidly enough before being destroyed would have been selected out of the pool of competing molecules while the more rapid dividers survived. Concurrently, slow dividers bearing structural motifs that enhanced their chemical and physical stability to the point where their replication rate was not a rate-limiting step to survival would also be selected. These molecules were under very different selection pressures in the absence of repair mechanisms, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't have survived without them. The much later appearance of repair mechanisms would merely have served to lift some of the selective constraints on these systems, allowing them to develop in new directions, but they would not necessarily be essential to their survival. Comparing modern DNA, which is no longer adapted to survival in harsh environments, to these early molecules does nothing other than highlight your colossal ignorance. Evolution can give you a theory that might on the surface seem possible, but when true science gets involved and scientists start asking questions, the problems and false logic of the theory become apparent. This is why evolution hopes that you don't know real chemistry. This statement only works when the true scientists know what they're talking about and are interested only in uncovering the true nature of reality instead of desperately trying to affirm their primitive beliefs regardless of the cost. With that said, let's take a closer look at the article you've been reading and at your alleged expert. Now I wish that I could say that the preceding narrative was mine, but it wasn't. Every single word came from a published article on chirality. Who was its author? Dr. Charles McCombs, a PhD organic chemist, an expert in the methods of scientific investigation, and a PhD scientist who has 20 chemical patents. He knows his stuff about chemicals. If you don't like this video, argue with the PhD chemist Firstly, let's take a look at this published article, shall we? Which scientific journal did it appear in? Was it Nature or maybe Science? No? Something a little more modest, perhaps? Maybe the Journal of Biological Chemistry? Actually, no. Following your link leads us straight to the web shite of the Institute of Creation Research. Funny that, but I suppose I should have expected nothing less. So, PP, you don't mind if I call you PP, do you? Why do you think that your friend didn't publish this in a real peer-reviewed scientific journal? Could it have been because it would have had to have been reviewed by real scientists? Could it be that once they'd read this putrid piece of filthy dishonesty, they would have rejected it as soon as they'd stopped laughing? And as for your scientist, your claim that he's an expert in the scientific method of investigation is blown out of the water by the mere fact that either he has not read the literature in the area he is writing about, or he is simply dishonestly ignoring it to make the point he wants to make regardless of the evidence that stands against it. Since he seems to have spent his entire career at the Eastman Chemical Company, it seems highly unlikely that he's an expert in the origins of life, and while that doesn't disqualify him in any way on writing in the subject, he should have felt it even more incumbent upon him to do some background reading before spilling his bullshit across the page. It doesn't matter if you've got 20 years of experience or 20,000, if you're going to write about science, you have a duty to critically read, assess, and cite the relevant work and not just ignore it as though it doesn't exist. These aren't the actions of an expert scientist, but of a despicable charlatan. So I suppose that it really shouldn't come as a surprise that you liked his article. Should it?